pray. Lord, we just thank you for all the good you've done for us. We just thank you that you died on the cross for us. You washed us clean with your blood. Those of us who believe are washed clean. And we need that because we can't earn it ourselves. And Lord, when times get hard, we get reminded of how much we need you. We can easily forget. But Lord, everything we have comes from you, is a gift from God above. Every good thing is a gift from you. And so Lord, in this trying time, we just pray that you would open up our hearts and minds to be receptive to you and your word and what you're saying to us. In Jesus' name, amen. So this morning we were supposed to be continuing with the Genesis series and we we're going to be looking at a really powerful story in Genesis which is how Joseph reconciles with his brothers and it was actually, we we're going to look at four or five whole chapters and just go through those chapters and I wanted to read the story to you and I, I, because it's so powerful, it's such an incredible story but what happened is five minutes after I finished my sermon on Thursday, <laughs> finished writing it, through God's word, I realized that I had to speak on something else. So my, the whole day I'd had on my heart the, the thought that, you know, a lot of churches are, are shutting down services today. A lot of churches are doing it completely online, especially larger churches. But I wanted to encourage fathers out there and families, if you, if you don't like to live stream or if you, if you would prefer, what you could do is just simply open up the Bible with your kids on Sunday morning and just explain a passage to them. And I put up this passage from Deuteronomy 6, verse 4 to 9, and it says this. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. And so what happened is, is I had that on my mind all day, all day Thursday, as I was working on my sermon. I was just thinking about what could families do in this time to continue worshipping and continue fellowshipping together. And then I read this passage and then I realised, is this how the revival begins? And then I put up a post on Facebook about it. Some of you might have seen it. I also put up a post on Social Galactic, which is another... Uh, another social media thing that I'm a part of and one guy responded and he said this he said they should pray and read the Bible and explain it that is how the revival begins and I realized that I could not preach the sermon that I was planning to this morning I had to preach something else and I had to preach this message we're going to look at this morning so what we're going to do this morning is we're going to look at many different times that God's people faced hard times in the Bible and we're going to see how they responded in those hard times, and we're going to see how God responded to their cries. Could this be the crisis which brings revival to this land? Many of us have been praying it for some time. Could this be it? Well, let's take a little tour through God's Word and how He responds to people in hard times, and let's see what God's Word says. And we're going to start off all the way back in Exodus. In Exodus, we're going to start in Exodus 21, verses 4 to 9. And it's interesting, one thing that we see in the Bible is that there is a long history of God's people forgetting how good God has been to them. So read with me, Exodus 21, 4 to 9, I'm reading from the ESV, the English Standard Version, and it says this. From Mount Hor they set out by the way to the Red Sea to go to, around the land of Edom. And people became impatient on the way, and the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we loathe this worthless food. And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, so that many of the people of Israel died. And the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people, and the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten when he sees it shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole, and if a serpent bit anyone, he would look at the serpent and live. So what's the context of this situation? They're in the wilderness, but what has just happened? God has redeemed them out of Egypt. 
He's rescued them from slavery to the most powerful nation on earth. He has brought them out. He's given them miraculous signs, the ten plagues, the splitting of the sea. He crushed Pharaoh's armies. He has done incredible things on behalf of his people to this point. Many, many mighty things. And what is their response? They're whinging. They're complaining. And you know what they're referring to when they say this worthless food? (laughs) Can can anyone tell me, what are they referring to when they say this worthless food? The manna from heaven. Literal food direct from heaven. Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I'm about to rain bread from heaven for you. They're eating heavenly bread. Many of us would love to try this. We don't know what it was like, but they were complaining. And the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day that I may test them, whether they walk in my law or not. The people of Israel ate the manna 40 years, and they came to a habitable land. They ate the manna till they came to the borderland of Canaan. God provided for them, but they whinge like selfish, wicked little babies. So God sent serpents to torment them. Then the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people so that many of Israel died. God sent this plague of serpents on them to punish them. And they cried out, and God gave them a way of deliverance. They repent, and he sends relief. See, God's people are often stubborn and hard of hearing and in need of chastisement. But God is gracious to those who seek his grace. But what we see here is important for our message this morning is this. These people correctly saw these hard times as God seeking to get their attention and they correctly repented and called upon the Lord. And that's important for our message this morning. And we see this trend all throughout the Bible. In fact, the book of Judges is basically all about this trend. Judges 3, verse 7 to 11. And the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. They forgot the Lord their God and served the Baals and the Asherah. Therefore the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel and he sold them into the hand of the Cushan Rishathaim, king of Mesopotamia. And the people of Israel served Cushan Rishathaim eight years. But when the people of Israel cried out to the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer for the people of Israel who saved them, Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother, the spirit of the Lord was upon him and he judged Israel. He went out to war and the Lord gave Cushan Rishathaim, king of Mesopotamia, into his hand and his hand prevailed over Cushan Rishathaim. I should have chosen a passage where it didn't have such a complicated name so many times. (laughs) So the Lord had rest for 40 years, then Othniel, the son of Kenaz, died. So what's happened is Joshua's died off And the elders that witnessed all of the things that happened in the time of Joshua and also to a degree the time of Moses have died off. And Israel has gone downhill incredibly quickly. They chased after the Baals and the Ashereth. And when it talks about the Baals here, it's referring to the various different local versions that people would would create to worship what they called Baal. And Baal just means Lord. And basically... Baal was the chief god of the Canaanites and he was a storm god and he was considered a provider. And when it talks about the Asheroths, the Asheroth poles that they worshipped is a reference to totem pole stole deities connected to the goddess Astarte. Now she was a fertility goddess and the Greek version of the fertility goddess we would all recognize, Aphrodite, she was the, she was the, that's the Greek version of Astarte. And her rituals often included sacred groves, sacred grove worship, sexual immorality, and they were all about fertility. So the provision of fertility, not just for children, but also for flocks. In other words, what the Israelites did is they turned away from the God who provided for them in the wilderness, who provided for them in Egypt, who provided for them all the way back in the time of Abraham, and they turned to the other gods to look for their provision. They turned away from God for their provision and turned to the false gods. They sought it in the ideology of the pagan people of the land of their day. And this led them into sin. So what did God do? God sent on them hard times, trials, oppressors, and how did they respond? 
they cried out. But when the people of Israel cried out to the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer for the people of Israel who saved them. Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother. They cried out to God for salvation, and God brought that deliverance. He sent judges to rescue them and show them how to live properly. And what we see in the book of the judges is as the judges walked in the land, the people stayed on track, and then when the judge died, they went off track, and then they had to call out on God again because they just kept falling into sin, and God had to keep sending them hard times, hard times. This cycle is entrenched in the book of Judges. Over and over again, this happens. But the important thing for our message this morning is that they saw hard times as a time to call out in repentance to God. And God heard their cries. But we see this in other places as well. And a really good example of this is Hezekiah, the righteous king. Now Hezekiah was a very good king. He was one of the best. In fact, it's going to say he was the greatest king that Israel had as far as righteousness. We'll read that soon. But he, he became king in the era that God punished Israel, the northern ten kingdoms. Hezekiah was the king of Judah, the southern kingdom, Judah and Benjamin. And we read this about Israel in the book of two kings, chapter 17, verse 6 to 8. In the ninth year of Hoshea, the king of Assyria captured Samaria and he carried the Israelites away to Assyria and placed them in Halar and on the harbor, the river of Gozan and the cities of the Medes. And this occurred because the people of Israel had sinned against the Lord their God who brought them up out of the land of Egypt from under the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and had feared other gods and walked in the customs of the nations whom the king drove out before the people of Israel and in the customs that the kings of Israel had practiced. Israel, the northern kingdom, was more wicked than the southern kingdom, Judah. But Judah was not exactly innocent itself. We are told this just a few verses down in the same chapter. 2 Kings 17, 11 to 13. And they did wicked things, provoking the Lord to anger, and they served idols of which the Lord had said to them, You shall not do this. Yet the Lord warned Israel and Judah by every prophet and every seer, saying, Turn from your evil ways and keep my commandments and my statutes in accordance with all the law that I commanded your fathers and that I sent you by my servants, the prophets. What was Israel's response to the prophets? <laughs> they didn't listen. The northern kingdom had no good kings. They just led the nation worse and worse into idolatry. So God sent them into exile and utterly destroyed them from the land. The northern kingdom was never and has never been reestablished. Because of God's judgment, they became a mixed, corrupted people, the Samaritans. And we see the enmity between the Jews and the Samaritans when we get to the Gospels. But Judah too deserved to be judged like Israel because they had also chased after the foreign gods. But Judah had one key difference to the northern kingdom Israel. Judah had good kings which called the nation back to righteousness. Look at this. We are told of Hezekiah. This is, it. This is fascinating because remember how good David was and you've got a great king like Uzziah and you've got a great king like Josiah. But who does the scriptures say was the greatest king of Israel? Well, it's Hezekiah. And he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord according to all that his father David had done. He removed the high places and broke the pillars and cut down the Asherah. And he broke in pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made. For until those days, the people of Israel had made offerings to it. It was called Neshatan. He trusted in the Lord, God, the, God, the Lord, the God of Israel, so that there was none like him among all the kings of Judah after him or among those who were before him. Why was he so great? Because he was a king who continually sought the Lord. In Hezekiah's day, the same Assyrian kingdom which punished Israel also came after Judah. And they surrounded Judah and Judah deserved Punishment, And in fact, if you read the book of Isaiah, this is in the days of Isaiah, if you read it, the first couple of chapters actually describe what happened in this war. And basically all of Judah's cities have been annihilated. Their crops have been taken, everything they have lost. 
and the armies surround the city. And all that is left really is Jerusalem. And the Assyrians, what did they do? They tempted Hezekiah in this time of trial to turn away from Yahweh and to trust in foreign gods and to put themselves under the trust of the, Assyria, uh, the Assyrian king. And so what did Hezekiah do? He did this. As soon as King Hezekiah heard it, this is a speech which one of the generals of Sennacherib gave from Assyria. He tore his clothes and covered himself with sackcloth and went into the house of the Lord. What did he do? He went in to pray and to seek the Lord. Why? Because he needed God's help. And he knew that God was the only one who could deliver him. And you know what happened? The prophet Isaiah tells Hezekiah, don't be afraid, God has got this. And again, God rescues his people in their time of distress. Again, hard times come because of the wickedness of God's people and they cry out in their distress and significantly, God delivers them. And this is really important to understand. What we have here is a righteous king who prays for his nation and this is what it says. In 2 Kings 19.20, Then Isaiah the son of Amos sent to Hezekiah, saying, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Your prayer to me about Sennacherib, king of Israel, I have heard. And God defeats Assyria for them. The great empire of this, this era, God defeats them for him. Over and over and over again in the scriptures, God does this for his people. Hard times come upon them. And what do they see it as? As a time to call out in repentance to the Lord. But he doesn't just do this for his people. He does it for other nations as well. Jonah and Nineveh. The book of Jonah is a wonderful book in the Bible. It's a small book. It's only a few chapters. And it's an incredibly powerful book. And we all know the story of Jonah and the whale or the giant fish or whatever it was, the sea creature which he spends three days in the belly of. How terrifying would that be? <laughs> but the book of Jonah is in the Bible for two reasons. One, it is to rebuke God's people for not having cared enough about the nations. See, the Israelites of this era, the, the, the Jews, they basically saw themselves as God's people and... and didn't want to be a blessing to the nations. Instead of being a blessing and a light to the nations, they became a curse to the nations and forgot about them and became wicked just like the nations. But it is also there to show us this, that God is the judge and saviour of all peoples and that his judgment comes on all nations because of their wickedness. But so does his grace if people call out to him. If people call out to him, his grace is for all peoples. Jonah 1, 1 to 3 tells us this. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that, that, great, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee from Tarshish, from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with, it, with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. Bless Jonah's heart. <laughs> what a silly thing to do. He thinks that he can run away from the presence of the Lord. <laughs> He's really silly, isn't he? But then again, haven't we ourselves been silly in this way, often ourselves? You know, traditionally speaking, uh, scholars have, have considered Tarshish to be on the coast of the southern coast of Spain. And so when you consider Nineveh as all the way over here in, uh, in the Middle East, and Joppa is down sort of off the coast of Israel in that sort of area, just off the coast there, you can see that he's trying to go to the furthest place he can get away from as possible. Now, I've read some evidence which shows that Tarshish actually might have been on the south of Britain. And the reason this evidence is, uh, the evidence for this is that the minerals of Tarshish, which they've found, they've actually found the deposits for these minerals were at the south of England rather than in Spain. So there's a bit of a debate of where exactly Tarshish was, but here's what we don't have to debate. It was as far away as Jonah could go, and that's what he was trying to do, get as far away from the Lord as possible. <laughs> he was trying to run to the ends of the earth, but we all know how God dealt with him <laughs> and brought him back to Nineveh. And so he comes into Nineveh, and he proclaims judgment on Nineveh. 
He says, God is going to wipe you out. I think it says in 40 days, if I remember correctly. He says, I'm going to, he's going to, God is going to judge you for your wickedness and wipe you out. And why didn't Jonah want to go to Nineveh? Because he didn't want them to be forgiven. He didn't want them to hear the message of God and be saved from their destruction because he knew the Assyrians were the great enemy of his people. And yet, once he goes there, he preaches this proclamation just of pure judgment. He just says, you're going to be destroyed. And what happens? This happens. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They called for a fast and put on sacrifices from the greatest of them to the least of them. The word reached the kingdom of Nineveh and he arose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth and sat in ashes. And he issued a proclamation and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed, let them not feed or drink water, but let the man and the beast be covered with sackcloth and let them call out mightily to God. Let everyone turn away from his evil and from the violence that is in his hands. Who knows? I love this verse. Verse 9. Who knows? God may turn and relent and turn from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them, and he did not do it. The people of Assyria, this wicked nation, and the Assyrian king himself, Hear the word of this righteous prophet. And what does the king do? He calls a time of repentance and prayer. And I love what he says here. He says, who knows? God may turn and relent from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. Jonah didn't say repent and be saved. You know what he just said? God is going to judge you. And yet the Assyrian people turned in faith to God And God relented and did not bring the destruction. This Assyrian king is a true righteous leader because he leads his nation in prayer and seeks God in a time of distress and publicly calls them out to seek upon the Lord. And that is what a righteous leader does when his nation is facing a time of trial. And God relents. And God relents. But what's fascinating here for Assyria, Nineveh, it was just the threat of hard times which caused them to repent. They hadn't even received the judgment yet. They hadn't even received the trials yet. They haven't even received the hard times. And it was just the concern that they were coming which caused them to turn to the Lord and repent and be saved. And it was a distress caused by their own wickedness. So my question to you this morning is what about today? What about us today? What should we be thinking in a time like this? Well, this is what I think. And this is what I think the scriptures tell us. As Christians, we should be taking this time to search our hearts and ask God what we need to repent of. Indeed, our whole nation should be taking this opportunity to seek the Lord and call out to Him and ask Him, what are you seeking to say to us in this time of distress? And especially for us as believers, we are told in Scriptures to always see hard times as times of discipline. Hebrews 12 verses 7 to 12 says this, It is for discipline that you have had to endure. God is treating you as sons, as children. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Beside this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them. But he disciplines us for our good that we may share in his holiness. For, the moment, all, for at the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. Very true. But later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Therefore, lift your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather 
be healed. As Christians, we should always see any hard time which is coming upon us as God trying to get our attention or seeking to refine us and call us back to him, disciplining us. It is for discipline that you have had to endure. And we especially see how God uses hard times all throughout the Old Testament to get people's attention. Now there are many Christians who will say to me right now, some of you might be thinking this this morning, some of you who are watching online, and some of you who watch this in the future might be saying, come on Matt, you can't use these Old Testament examples uh, in this way because we're not under the Old Covenant. What are you doing? Why are you doing this? Well, I will simply respond by showing what the New Testament teaches about such things. Romans 15.4 For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures we might have hope. In other words, if the Old Testament says that in times of distress we should call upon the Lord to relieve us from that, that was written for our instruction. For New Testament believers. And this isn't just a one-off verse. 1 Corinthians 6 verse 10 to 11. Now these things took place as examples for us. That we might not desire evil as they did. Do not be idolaters as some of them were as it is written. The people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. We must not indulge in sexual immorality as some of of them did. And 23,000 fell in a single day. We must not put Christ to the test as some of them did and were destroyed by serpents. Notice that? That was the passage that I read right at the beginning of the sermon. Paul quotes it, references it directly that it was there to teach new covenant believers. Nor grumble as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now these things happened to them, Old Testament believers, as an example to us, New Testament believers, but they were written down for our instruction on whom the end of the ages have come. So not only is it wise to learn from the Old Testament, the Apostle Paul is telling us it was written for our instruction, for those who believe in Christ today. The way that God dwelt with his people in the Old Testament is supposed to teach us, instruct us. We are God's people today and we must learn how God dealt with his people in the past so we can see how we should respond to him now. Hard times should be seen as, by God's people as a time of reflection and a time of repentance and a time to seek God. So let me ask this question. Is this how the revival begins? I don't know but I'm praying it is. Because how we see hard times, we see in the Old Testament how hard times brought people to repentance and revival over and over again in the Old Testament. And if God can revive Nineveh, the wicked nation, you know, of Assyria, one of the most wicked nations, in fact, the Bible describes it as one of the most wicked nations in the ancient world. If he can revive them and get them to call upon the Lord, how much more us today in Australia? We need to be seeking God powerfully now as his people. We need to ask him to reveal to us our hidden faults so that we can repent of them ourselves. And we need to repent of trusting in mammon and possessions. We have chased after the Baals and the Asherahs of our day. We just call them currency and financial portfolios and career choices, but they have become gods to us. And this is important. This crisis is teaching us that our prosperity is not dependent on us and our hard work. It's dependent on God and his provision. And a lot of people are learning that right now. All of us are. We're all having to learn that right now. We often fall into the trap of thinking that our prosperity is because of what we have done. But it comes as a blessing from God. And you know, just before Israel was judged by God with Assyria, They had one of of their most prosperous times in the history of the nation. And what does Amos say? Woe to you who are at ease in Zion. Why? Because our prosperity is something which we rely on God from. Our possessions, everything 
is a gift from God. And, and hard times remind us of that. Because we realize no matter what effort we've put in, they can be taken away in a moment. God is calling out to his church in this crisis. I am certain of that. Not because I am some prophet or something, but because I've just read God's word and seen what he uses hard times to do and how his people responded and how he responded to that. He brings hard times on his nations and his people because he wants to get their attention to call out to him and return to him. And so here is a call to us all and here is what I would like us to do as a church. And anyone who's listening, I encourage you, this is, what we, this is what I think we should do. Let's all set aside a time to fast and pray and call for God's relief in this time. Even if it's just for a morning. Even if just tomorrow morning you decide, I'm, I'm going to have breakfast and I'm going to set some time this morning where I'm going to pray and call out to the Lord. Just set aside a time to fast and pray. We saw how often the people did this in the Old Testament and we saw how God responded. And I don't know about you, but I'm pretty sure we all agree with this actually. It's the same God and he responds in the same way. There's no reason why that has changed. Also, let's not forget that the church exists to be a blessing to the nations. I know in a time of hardness we think how we're going to look after ourselves and our family and there's nothing wrong with that as wise. But we also got to be thinking outwardly as well how we can help people in need. Maybe if we have a little bit extra and we know someone is struggling, we can step out in faith and share it with them in this time. Because at the end of the day, no matter what we've got, it's a gift from God anyway, and it can be taken away at any moment. You know, there are people who might be hoarding garages full of food and toilet paper who might get sick from this virus and not get to consume any of it. like the parable of the rich fool in scripture. And I'm not saying it's wrong to set aside a little extra. It's obviously, it's wise to have a little bit of extra to provide for your family. But also be thinking, how can we as a church be a blessing in this time? And I encourage you, Google this and just look at how the church responded in past times of crisis and be inspired. That is what God calls us to do in, in times of distress. And my last bit of application is very simple. Let's pray for our leaders and for our politicians, and especially for our Christian Prime Minister to start to call upon and seek upon the Lord. I have no doubt that Scott Morrison is praying. I have no doubt about that. He's a, he's a man of faith. But what I would love to see him do is to call our nation to prayer. And let's just pray that God puts his burden on the hearts of our leaders. I don't care if they're far left Greens or far right, whatever it is. Pray for them all that God would put a burden on all their hearts to seek the Lord. You can't get any more ungodly than the king of Assyria. (laughs) And yet look what God did. So let's pray for this for our leaders and pray for them to make wise decisions in this hard time. But the wisest thing they can do is call upon the Lord like the king of Assyria did. Is this how the revival begins? Like I said, I don't know. But I am going to pray that it is. See, we have been the land of plenty for too long. And our bellies have grown soft, our hearts have grown hard, and our souls are famished. And God is calling out to us. We need God to revive his work in this land. We need him to revive it, and we need to pray and ask him to do so. And you know what? We look at all these these passages from the scripture this morning. He does respond. He does hear those prayers. He does help his people in times of distress. I don't know about you, but I am both challenged by what I see in these passages, but also greatly encouraged that we have a God, the provider God, the healer God, the ruler of this world God, who promises to respond to us in our time of need. Let's call out to him and let's see what amazing things he does in this time. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for your word. And Lord, we are facing a trial at this time in our nation. Your scriptures teach us that trials come upon your people to refine us. Lord, I'm not perfect. I have let the stress get to me in different ways just in the last week. And I just pray that you would help me to be refined in this process. And I just pray for everyone here that you would let 
them to be refined by this process and for everyone listening and Lord we just pray that our nation would call out to you we thank you for the kind of God you are we pray for your revival in this land we pray for your work to go forth and for great things to be done by you through your church in this time in Jesus name Amen